Hi, everyone, and welcome to this conversation on all things emoji. We're coming to you from Future Tense, which is a partnership of Slate Magazine, New America, and Arizona State University that looks at the intersection of policy, society, and technology. I'm Tori Bosch, the editor of Future Tense, and uh, I'm so excited to be here. I wish I could show you a, an emoji to really capture that excitement because I think so many times they do capture those kinds of emotions and gestures better than words can. Uh, after I introduce our wonderful speakers, we'll spend about 45 minutes discussing some of the questions that surround the creation and governance of emoji, uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So you can submit your questions at any point in our discussion. So first we have Gretchen McCulloch, who is an internet linguist who explores the language of the internet for the people of the internet. She's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Because Internet, Understanding the New Rules of Language, which was published in 2019 and was named a best book of the year by Time, Amazon, and the Washington Post. Gretchen also writes the resident linguist column at Wired and has written for the New York Times, New York Magazine, Slate, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal and The Toast, which is dear to my heart. <laughs> she has a master's in linguistics from McGill University and has spoken at South by Southwest and EmojiCon. She's also the creator of the daily linguistics podcast, All Things Linguistic, and the co-creator of Lingthusiasm, a podcast that is enthusiastic about linguistics. <laughs> and then we have Jennifer Daniel, who is the Unicode Emoji Subcommittee Chair, which is a very enviable title for anyone to have. Her first contribution to Unicode was standardizing gender inclusive representations in emoji. She was a former graphics editor at the New York Times and is co-author and illustrator of a number of graphics books, including How, the, How to Be Human, Space, Exclamation Point, and The Origins of Almost Everything. Her work has been recognized by the Walker Art Museum, the Society of Illustrators, and published in The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and Time Magazine, just to name a few. So thank you both for being here with Future Tense today. Um, I'd like to start by asking you if you each have a favorite lesser used emoji. Going for the deep cuts. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so one that occurs to me uh, is the sailboat emoji. Um, which has a particular meaning in uh, a few of my friend groups. Um, so uh, in a few friend slacks and discords that I'm in, uh, we have a channel called Whining on the Yacht. Um, and this is when you have some sort of problem that's almost too trivial to complain about, and yet you still want to complain about. And sort of the archetypal example is, I'm here on this yacht, I have this nice free drink, and the ice cubes in it aren't my preferred style of ice cubes. <laughs> And so it's the sort of, you know, self-reflexive annoyance and particularly good yacht wines are awarded a yacht, uh, a sailboat emoji. <laughs> so it's got this sort of in-group meeting with, with that particular friend group. That's delightful. Jennifer, how about you? I, I will say I've never heard anyone talk about using any of the transportation emojis. So you already <laughs> win on identifying <laughs> used ones. Uh, I ha I've been taken to the natural disaster emoji lately. So the volcano, when I have big, strong feelings, or the tornado, plus basically any emoji. So um, tornado poop, when I'm describing my kids, or tornado, <laughs> I don't even know, uh, coffee, when I'm guzzling it in the morning. So yeah, I've been using nature, a lot of nature these days. I love that the tornado is sort of emphatic modifier. Um, which is I'm sure not the technical term, but how I will think about it. <laughs> Sounds very technical to me. <laughs> uh, so also one quick question is I wanna get the language right here. Is the plural emoji or emojis? Emoji. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun question. Uh, it, it, for me, it depends on what you're trying to signal. <laughs> um, so people who are uh, trying to signal like they like emoji specialization or an awareness of emojis roots in Japan use unmarked emoji without the S uh, and people who are anglicizing it more intensely use emojis with the S because they're thinking like this is completely adapted into my vocabulary this is something that I'm just using I'm not thinking about it as a Japanese thing like it's it's English for me uh, and so it sort of depends on what you want to signal Jennifer is a deep cut emoji specialist and she's going to say emoji as the plural it doesn't surprise me at all uh, but there are also people who who use emojis um, 
I, we used emojis recently on a project that I was working on because we wanted to signal like young approachability to a younger audience. Um, so it really depends on what you're, what you're trying to signal. Well, I will try to use emoji in this, but I cannot <laughs> promise I won't slip if up with an you emoji. You use what feels good to you. Like, <laughs> I actually didn't realize why I like emoji. That's just the standard that which the people I'm around use. That, that's, <laughs> that's what Unicode people say. <laughs> well, so now that I know I should be, at least in this context, perhaps saying emoji, um, Jennifer, could you tell us a little bit about sort of how the Unicode subcommittee works? You know, how does a tornado become an emoji? Well, one day when two people love each other very much, <laughs> they get together and they write a proposal for a tornado. Uh, it, I mean, a lot of emoji have lots of different origins. I suppose if you wanted to make, like if we were talking about a specific emoji, like how a, specific emoji came into being, we can talk about one. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good one, uh, but of course nothing comes to mind. There's tears of joy. I mean, there's obviously the tears of joy emoji. We can talk, you know, it's, it's nice when you have like a specific one in mind versus like all of them uh, possibly be. Um, tears of joy was one of those smiley faces that everyone types with regular punctuation, just colon, comma, or apostrophe, uh, dash, and then paren, but it didn't exist in emoji. Uh, way so it was it was sort of a one of those things where the best emoji are ones that are really obvious where you're just like that was an emoji I swear that was an emoji but it was never emoji <laughs> so you kind of start looking to see how people are currently using it is it being currently used fortunately it is because it's made of punctuation and then you can kind of compare it to other punctuation smileys right just compare it to the regular smiley or the frowny smiley or a number of other kinds and and through different measuring like you could use video or search results or image results any kind of way of measuring how people are using it online and see okay how does this this oh it's actually more people are using this sequence of punctuation and then i mean i'm already talking about like the criteria for inclusion now but basically you want to get a sense of the popular the frequency of use that isn't rhetorical like it's actually grounded in reality and it's been happening for a long time it's not just like happening this year or even kind of this decade you really want to go back decades of how people have been using it uh and then unicode has a whole document about submitting emoji proposals i don't think we have to go line by line but the most important parts of them really are around frequency of use and um, multiple uses and how it'll be used with other emoji so you really want to get a sense of this is emoji, is this emoji flexible? Like language, like can it be, is it just going to mean literally I'm crying while I'm smiling? No, 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 no. It's gonna mean so much more than that. It's going to really express things, how you feel, not just actually how you contort your face and leak water out of your eyes, right? It's gonna actually bring you somewhere more metaphorical. Um, and then how it's used with other emoji is really important because you wanna add new emoji that operate and expand how we use them generally and, and specifically, like my example of the tornado, right? Like how can it be used with other emoji to bring me somewhere more me, right? Like it, it doesn't just mean one thing. And there's a number of other criteria as well, but. And I, I think that's one of the things that people sometimes don't think about with respect to Unicode is that once Unicode adds a symbol, whether it's an emoji or a you know punctuation character or anything else, they never remove it. And so, if we add something that's like a big trend this year, it's just why, you know, there are no no actual people who become emoji, because even if this year we want like this pop star who we're all a fan of to become an emoji, like in 10 years or 20 years or 50 years, people are gonna be like, what, why? So they don't even open that can of worms because if something's too evanescent, then it, it you know, it's a, that's a problem. So like at a really basic level, what does it mean for Unicode to add an emoji? Like what? What does that kickstart? How does it go from Unicode deciding to add it to it showing up on my iPhone? Well, I I work on Android, so I, I couldn't Sorry. tell you about the phone, but <laughs> I could tell you about Unicode. Uh, Unicode is think of Unicode as your um, your friendly plumber. They lay they lay the plumbing down so that folks at Apple or Google or Twitter or whoever can then fill those pipes 
with emoji. I'm going to continue this metaphor. Um, they effectively, everything on, when you read something online, you know, the letter A is assigned a code point. So it always, you can reliably know that you're going to be reading the letter A. And emoji operate the same way. They're, it's effectively a font. They're not little tiny images that you, you know, that are animated or like bitmap, right? Or GIF. They're, they're, they're a font and they're assigned a code point, which makes them lightweight. It also means that's why you can insert them anywhere there's a text field online. Um, and so once there's a code point, once those data files are released, really, it's just, you know, off to the races, you know, it's basically anyone who, who wants to, there's no, you don't have to, but if you want to, you now have a code point that can be assigned an image that will reliably look like that image when you send it to someone else. And it's that interoperability that really makes Unicode good. Honestly, like what they're doing is a service to all of us. Like we can actually send not just emoji to emoji to someone, but we can send something in Arabic to someone else and they can read it in Arabic, which wasn't possible before Unicode came along. And that's really their mission is to digitize the world's languages in some meaningful way so that we can continue doing- It's kind of like, to continue your plumbing metaphor, like it's like how the electricity as it arrives in your house is sort of standardized and you have like a certain type of jack that you can plug all your devices into. And so you can plug in like any sort of device into that jack, but you know the electricity company is giving you like a particular kind of electricity so that all of your devices can work with that. Uh, so it's it's sort of that invisible like internet plumbing that people, I mean, the Unicode Consortium's existed since the 1980s, right? So people haven't paid as much attention to until Emoji started. Thank you. You know, it's just, uh, and I thank the emoji for bringing that to our attention because it is something that's really difficult for people to sort of understand is this architecture that supports our ability to communicate with, with one another. Uh, so Unicode will create sort of the, the font essentially, but then every platform will implement it a little bit differently. So could you talk a little bit about how much you Unicode wants standardization across say Slack, iPhone, and Android, or other ways that platforms can maybe create problems or opportunities there? I mean, it's it's called the Unicode standard, right? They, they create guidelines, but they're not the police. You know, they're, they're just here to like say, this is what you guys should do. This is what it should be. Here's an example. We spent two years vetting it. Go, you know, be fruitful and multiply, right? And so I would say less about what, it's not necessarily, I mean, I care about it <laughs> as, as part of the subcommittee, but I would say that the group as a whole cares deeply about it. And in the past, I'm not sure, before I was involved, I'm not sure how much they did care about it. I think it was more like, thank you, Unicode. We will accept this gift that you have given us. And then they went off and they, did what they did with it you know they aligned it to their brand or they they shoved it in their keyboards or you know some people embraced it other people kept it at a distance but they kind of just did their own thing and then they were like wait oh oh this isn't a moment for branding this is this is actually communication and it matters when you send something x to and it looks like x and I think for the past couple of years you've really seen a reconciliation there where people are aligning more uh, in a meaningful way so that you, when you're sending something, you're, you're, yeah. And I think, I actually think that's in the past couple of years, that's mostly been addressed, at least for the most frequently, frequently used emoji. Yeah. It turns out users really hate it when I send something from my Android and they, it shows up as a completely different looking emotion on my friend's iPhone. And I'm like, but I wasn't trying to be sarcastic. I was trying to be sad for you. Uh, people really hate that. Uh, and I think vendors in the past two years have been realizing that. I mean, just I when I first joined, I was like, I didn't understand the the fragmentation at all. You know, I was like, when I first, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna look at all the emoji, do an audit, get like a sense of like what this ecosystem looks like. And I was like, what? Why? What? There <laughs> <laughs> was a lot of uh, this is, and you know what? It was easily fixed. That's the thing. It's like actually, it was a, so they were just like you need to talk to you. Go, just go talk. And they're like, oh, nice to meet you. And you're like, you never met before? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, like, you know, it's just like anything else, any other relationship. It's just about, getting, you know, meeting and, and figuring it out. It is sort of nice that there are at least some differences. I mean, it's fun to look at whose hamburger puts the tomato underneath 
the patty rather on top. So it, it's, yeah, it's a, it's nice to see like a small, a bit of a diversity in how the platforms um, integrate them while keeping things consistent enough yet yeah, to, to communicate what you want. I think it's a big difference between what people do with what, what the platforms do with the object emoji versus what they do with the sort of face emoji. Uh, and that's where like the face emoji need to align really precisely because this eyebrow is like slightly different on this platform versus this other platform, it can create a really different emotional interpretation. Whereas you say like the exact styling of the hamburger or like the exact ingredients in the salad or like what color the fish is, uh, like what the birthday cake looks like. Those are areas where, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter exactly how many candles you have on this one birthday cake versus the other birthday cake because the you know, like people, people aren't using the object emoji for as precise meanings in some cases as they're using the, the face ones. Well, we're also like biologically ingrained to read people's faces, like micro expressions. And so like, we are paying attention to the details of the smileys in a way that we're not the burger. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe food, I'd be curious about how we look at food and how, you know, how the brain, what part of the brain is activated, but uh, the smileys really are where it's most important. I would totally agree. Yeah, I mean, and the smileys, of course, you know, in some ways are sort of the original emoji, as you said. Um, but it feels like smileys, faces, people are where things can get the most tricky in terms of representation, as well as in terms of interpretation. I mean, could you talk a little bit about how representation and emoji ha have changed over recent years? I mean, um, I have a pretty different philosophy around additions that, let's put it this way. I think there have been efforts to increase a sense of inclusion, but they didn't result in more diversity. And they created zones of exclusion unintentionally. And so largely what I've been trying to do is find ways to make things more broad and less specific. So the gender inclusive work largely wasn't about adding a third gender that would be alienating a great deal of other types of genders. It's about adding the concept of a spectrum of gender. And that is much more broad than distinctly male or female. And that allows people to be to kind of play in a space rather than specifically say this, this looks like me, this is more, this is representative and makes it is what I feel like. And I think that's, that's really important is that the emoji aren't meant to literally reproduce reality, but effectively let you play with language just the way you like you play with your own identity. Yeah, Gretchen, I think this gets a little bit to something that you've talked about as well, which is that like emoji are not words, right? You know, what exact function do you see them using instead of like a literal translation of what we see there? Yeah, the the way that I like to talk about how emoji function communication, and this is, uh, I wrote a, wrote a whole paper about this with, with Lauren Gahn, who is also a mutual friend of, of me and Jennifer, um, and is emoji as... Uh, a type of gesture or emoji is having a similar communicative function as gesture, even though th sometimes there's this very obvious one-to-one -one mapping, you know, you have a thumbs up emoji, you have a, you have a peace sign, you have, uh, you know, like all of these different kinds of literal, you know, cross fingers, physical shapes. But there's also the sense that when you look at how people use emoji, they're often doing it as an accompaniment to words, whether that someone else said this thing and I send back a smiley face uh, in, in reply, or uh, like a laughing emoji, I send that back in reply, or I say this thing and I add a few emoji at the end that are sort of the context in which I want it to be interpreted. You know, so if I say, good job, versus if I say, you know, good job and flip someone off, which maybe I'm not going to do on this family friendly stream, um, the, uh, then that one of those is sarcastic, right? Uh, one of, or a good job with the, the eye roll emoji, which is family friendly. Um, one of those is more sarcastic than the other. And I can do that with physical gestures uh, in, in space and broaden the scope of interpretation for what I'm saying. And I can also do that with how gestures, in, how emoji influence the context of what I'm saying about the, about the, the words that I'm, the literal words that I'm producing. And I think that and this sort of explains some of the usage patterns that we see in emoji. For one thing, people really like repeating an emoji. 
you know, you have like, you know, the top emoji strings a few years ago when I was looking into this were tears of joy, tears of joy as like number one, tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy as number two, and tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy as number three. Uh, and, and, you know, and then you go down and you find other, other strings of repetition, or even when it's not sort of simple repetition, like the exact same emoji, it'll be like complex repetition, like parts of different colors. And so you're still doing stuff that's very sort of repetitive in spirit. And that's not really how people use language most of the time. You know, here I am saying words <laughs> and there are a bunch of different words that are sort of derogated, right? It's, it's not that I'm just gonna say emoji, 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 <laughs> emoji, emoji, emoji. I mean, I could do that, but that would be sort of a performance piece. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what my meetings sound like, Gretchen. That's just <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've actually been bugging you. That's how I, that's how I got that clip. Um, but, uh, you know, so, but when it comes to emoji, you do see a lot of that repetition. Um, and yet gestures are an area where you do see what, so, see what researchers call beat gestures. So I'm going like, okay, here's what's going on. This is me doing the same hand shape in a repetitive beat manner. And that seems to be more like what's going on in the emoji domain. We do see a lot of repetition in gestures. And the other thing is it from the kind of other spectrum, there's the sort of naturalistic emoji use of like, okay, I'm gonna add a few emoji to influence the context of how you want something to be interpreted. Or if someone's talking, I can give like a nod or a, oh, wow, you know, shaking your head. And that's sort of the emoji reaction to what someone else is saying. And then on the other end of the spectrum, people do play games with gestures. You know, people play charades, people play like, you know, acting out, you know, sort of pantomime type games with, with gestures. And people play those sorts of games with emoji where it's like, oh, I'm going to retell the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song in emoji. But it's, that's a playful function. It's not, I'm going to, you know, stop using letters, I think it's very clear, you know, many years into emoji being widely available on our phones that people haven't stopped using letters because emoji have shown up. And so the emoji stories are a playful thing. They're not a replacement for, you know, your workaday communication. It's funny you mentioned that. I don't know if either of you have read uh, The Unseen World by Liz Moore, um, which is a, a novel that's about AI and ethics and it's it's really really wonderful but I mentioned it and I was going to bring it up anyway because um, in the book far in the future um, the the main character is now an older academic who talks about how younger people only communicate in what they call glyphs which seem to be like an evolved version of emoji and young people have to tutor the old people and only use words you know as a sort of sock to the older people so you don't see it heading in that direction no no, no, no. Like, it's a cute science fiction device, but it's like time travel. It's like, oh, that was fun. But no, like, <laughs> no. <laughs> because the thing is, is like, there are languages with different writing systems. Um, but first of all, for a society to transition to a different writing system, um, that's, a, that's possible, you know, uh, in Turkey, and I think the 1920s, they transferred from an Arabic based alphabet to a Roman based alphabet. You know, this is a thing that's happened in various places. But it's this sort of massive infrastructural issue that requires a lot of like state support and you have to reprint all your books. Um, and even that is not as big of a wholesale change. So like we could, you know, switch out and stop using the Roman alphabet, but we would still be speaking English using it. And I mean, I, I challenge anybody who thinks this is a real possibility to spend like 10 minutes trying to actually do it. Just like, okay, great. So for the next, you know, the next time you're trying to text with someone, send text only an emoji, and it turns into this guessing game where the other person's like using words to guess what they're trying, what you're trying to say. Um, and, you know, like, it's just, no. <laughs> it's so, it's rock on so many levels. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I guess, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, no, I was just going to just, just briefly piggyback, like what you mentioned in your book, Gretchen, the, the idea of emoji being co-speech. And I think mm -hmm. you even credit that to why it's it has maintained popularity because it isn't its own language. It works with all the other languages and because it interplays, that allows it to sustain and fill in the gaps that plain text is not sufficient in conveying in all the examples that, that she provided. And right. so while there are moments for like, 
Weird Al moments of play, being playful with language, right? What you can do with words and you can be playful with emoji in that way and make it more of a party game, sure. Uh, but effectively when you're telling someone, you know, like, where are you? I can't find you. And you, you want to convey some sense of urgency. You're not going to have them guess how you feel, right? Like you're, you want them to have an immediate read of it. Yeah. And, and like, it turns out it's actually really hard to get people to learn a new language. Um, <laughs> and people, you know, people find it difficult. They find it challenging. You have all this vocabulary to memorize. Like, uh, and it has not actually been hard to get people to adopt emoji. Like technological implementation wise, there have been challenges, but people can see an emoji and be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna start using this. And they don't actually need, like the thing that's useful about language is you can communicate beyond the here and now. It's not just like, I'm gonna like point to a bunch of different objects. It's, I can talk about abstract ideas, you know, um, I can talk about, you know, I, I can talk about this question of like, how do emoji work? Uh, and that's a sort of broad question. You can't talk about an emoji. There is no emoji for emoji. <laughs> Oh, I just, would use the A B C D emoji. Talk about emoji. I just, those are letters. Oh, those so are letters. <laughs> you're, already, you're just using letters. Uh, <laughs> like, you just put the letters in a box. It's just letters in a, it doesn't belong to be an emoji. It does all the things it needs to be. Why does it exist? It doesn't exist and it's not an emoji. It's just a bunch of letters. <laughs> but yeah, like it's... and. You know, people have tried to make, you know, universal languages and stuff like that. But the the things that are really sort of interesting and exciting about emoji in many cases are either the stuff that's very deliberately not linguistic, like these all these facial expressions that are hard to describe in words and the Unicode names for them sound kind of silly because they're not conveying the same thing. Or it's something like, oh, here's the eggplant and someone has to tell you what that means. And it doesn't mean that for everybody. Um, you have to be sort of inducted into the society of people who know what the eggplant emoji means. So, it, you know, the stuff that's really exciting about emoji is all of the stuff that's sort of non-obvious. It actually gets to something I think about a lot. Well, so in May, there's a horrifying conversation on Slate's Slack in which I learned that several of my colleagues use the slightly smiling face, mostly as a kind of screw you rather than <laughs> as a smiley face. And some of them seem to be surprised that everyone didn't see it that way. And I was realizing I might've been telling people screw you when I just meant to communicate some warmth. I mean, so are there ways in which the malleability and the way the meaning of an emoji change between person to person can create problems? I mean, are there ways to sort of navigate those misunderstandings between emoji use? I think that, you know, that's a very passive aggressive use of an emoji, yeah. right? Uh, and it's a sort of sarcastic or double meaning use of emoji. And there are also, you know, sarcastic or passive aggressive punctuation or particular words. You know, I've had Everyone completely disagrees about email sign-offs. You know, there are lots of different, you know, some people are like, if I say best, that means I hate you. And some people are like, but well, obviously you just say best. It's like an ordinary thing to say. Um, and so there, there's a sense in which, okay, if you're, if you're going to use something as a sort of subtle nod to passive aggression, that for you and a few people you know is passive aggressive, you need to expect that in an internet context where you're communicating with a bunch of people from different backgrounds and different understandings of things that not everyone is going to receive the exact subtleties of the passive aggression that you are trying to convey. And in some cases, that sort of plausible deniability is actually what people are aiming for. So if I know that I'm being passive aggressive when I sign an email sincerely, and I also know the other person will not necessarily be able to put their finger on why it seems a little bit hostile, or maybe they'll interpret it as if I was being positive. That's this sort of private in-joke with myself that I can have. Um, and it does sometimes the failure in communication is the point, or the, the plausible deniability of it is the point, because I, I did a lot of research into the sarcasm literature for, for Because Internet as well. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting is that sarcasm is a linguistic trust fall. You can, you express sarcasm even in sort of gold standard, like face-to-face, -face, full bandwidth communication. Um, sarcasm always involves two parts. One of them is the stating of the sarcasm. The other is acknowledgement on the part of the recipient that you've received the sarcasm and you've acknowledged it as such. And sarcasm can go wrong even in that full bandwidth face-to-face -face communication. And so, of course, it can go wrong online because, you know, once you remove a little bit of that bandwidth and things have, have the potential for miscommunication more and anything that's sarcastic or passive aggressive or ironic 
is a when someone gets it, when someone understands your sarcasm for what it is, they're signaling that they're a member of a similar sort of speech community as you are. And when someone doesn't get it, it's a signal that they're sort of an outsider. But if you want, you know, we communicate with so many people across different groups. If you want people to really get an overt message, you need to actually say it. Uh, and if you want to convey something really subtle, you need to accept the possibility that your message could be misinterpreted, which sometimes is the point. But it's, I think we've, you know, there are enough emoji that have double meanings and, and sarcastic and like additional layers of interpretation that I don't think any one person knows all of the possible meanings in that space. And I think it's unrealistic to expect that, that everyone's just going to come with this knowledge. Yeah, there's um, a, a great moment in the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City a few months ago in which there was a massive argument about whether a thumbs up emoji meant F you. And it was, <laughs> I highly recommend watching it um, for the plausible deniability reason. But right, exactly. Particular smiley faces, there have been studies demographically about different interpretations of emoji. And so, for example, I forget the name of the study. I wish I, I could cite it. Uh, I believe they showed that emoji to a, a number of folks in China. And they're like, what does this mean to you? Right. And they're like, don't trust that person. They look like they're humoring me. I would, that is not, that is not a smiley I would use. But you show it to another group of individuals, perhaps yourself, and they're like, seems pleasant. <laughs> they seem they seem trustworthy. I trust that person. Uh, and so you see that both culturally, you'd see it with age, like younger folks tend to use the the more Edward Monk kind of looking one to say surprise, whereas older folks use that to mean being scared. And so an important part of emoji is that they are alongside words. So the words can clarify that intent, right? So if you're using it in a way that's sincere, that should hopefully be able to be conveyed in that message. And to Gretchen's point, if it's being used sarcastically, hopefully you have a relationship with that person, know their sense of humor, that it would be used sarcastically. Uh, and you see this with other sort of pragmatic particles as well. I mean, you talk about this also in your, your book, Gretchen, but just like anything that can indicate to the recipient that you're just, you just understand them, you just get them, you just, you, you're chill. You, you're on the same page here. And emoji do a lot of the heavy lifting there just to connect because you're physically not in the same space. It's a good idea if you're communicating with someone on a regular basis to have a sense of sort of what their baseline norms are. Like, oh, this person always ends their text with a period or this person never ends their text with a period. And so when they do something that's different from what their baseline is, and we sort of develop a sense of this without thinking about it too hard. Um, when they do something that's different, you're like, oh, maybe they have their driving and someone else is using their phone to reply back to my text or uh, maybe they're they're trying to communicate some sort of additional level of message. But I, I think one of the things that I try to encourage people to do is have sort of open-ended, exploratory, curious conversations about what something means for a person in that context. So it's not that one way has to be right and one way has to be wrong, or that like just because some people in one group are using an emoji in a particular way means that you need to necessarily change what you're doing if you're mostly hanging out in a different group of people. Um, it's we can have these meta level conversations about how we're using emoji and find out what someone means by it because you can't possibly can you know make a, a permanent directory of what all of them mean because this is changing but that's okay and you have this sort of conversations about like oh what did you mean by this in this context or figuring out what someone's using based on based on other kind of kinds of context cues and i think that's sort of a more expansive definition that I would also like to have people approach to to language and to other kinds of communication where we're sort of having this attitude of curiosity about what people mean. Yeah, Jennifer, you talked about how when Unicode is deciding which emoji to adopt, you look at how um, people are, are using it in conversation. So does this sort of like metaphorical use come up much? I mean, how do you like when you're exploring uh, whether to add one, how are you thinking about the different ways people might use the same symbol? We try not to get theoretical, like how could they use it, right? It's more like, how are they using it? We do try to anticipate things like abuse, for example, but I think most of it is grounded in how is it being used because it, it's just, I mean, language is, unstoppable it's from human minds interacting with each other you know like they will determine what it means not like not the consortium the consortium just like recognizes what's already being used um 
but yeah, the multiple uses is super is super relevant because you you don't want to add something that is only singular in nature. Um, and that's sort of a tricky question when it comes to something like Unicode because people can't use a Unicode based emoji in all of the context in which they might want to use it until it's already encoded. So like a dictionary can say, okay, most people are making words in English are the same 26 letters. Let's see what let's see what new words people have come up with this year that we should be adding to our, you know, Merriam-Webster or Oxford or, or any of the, the dictionaries. They can be sort of keeping an eye on what people are doing with a finite set of combinatorial things. Uh, and with emoji, that's more difficult because there are places where people can use different kinds of custom emoji, you know, pl platforms like Slack and Discord, where users can upload small images, and then they're usable within that particular platform uh, for a particular set of users, um, which, you know, I wish we had more data about how people were using custom emoji there, because I think it's a really interesting place of like, what are people doing if you give them the ability to upload any tiny image, uh, which ones are really common? I We don't have data on this yet, but it'd be, it'd be really interesting to find out. Um, and it is sort of a more challenging proposition to say, well, what would people use in a tiny image, but they don't have the ability to send it yet? Well, I don't think you have to be restricted to digital spaces, right? You right. just look at how people already communicate, just like you and I, Tori, right now, or in <laughs> pop culture, or in manga, or in graph in, in any any sort of visual ephemera. You can be like, okay, when people are feeling like this is too, this is too much, there's too much happening, their faces all melt. Like you just like go, you mm. melt into a puddle. You see it, you see it in a comic, you see it all the way to Looney Tunes. They've been using that sort of visual morphine for over a hundred years. You can then say, okay, this is a very well-established visual representation of feeling. And then it can graduate to the point of it scaling in digital spaces. But I don't think it has to have digital origins. It really is just about how we, how things exist in the world. And again, not trying to reproduce them because the example, like my face isn't literally melt, melting off, but it's like how I feel. And how is that being represented? Yeah, that's a good point. So if there's a, you know, GIF that's really popular for a particular emotion, or there's, you know, something that's, that's used as a convention in, in cartoon spaces, then be like, okay, or or something that's already being used as a gesture. I know the uh, Mano a Bursa gesture, which is the sort of Italian gesture that you, that you do, uh, was recently added to Unicode. And that's a gesture that was already common. It has a name in Italian. Um, and you could use this sort of hand shape for other types of things, like that's just a shape the hands can make, even if you don't have the mano versa gesture as, you're, as an English speaker necessarily, but that's something that's sort of established in a at least one cultural context. Yeah, and I think you can even cite written language examples, like the smile with tear, like that, that happens in Shakespeare. Shakespeare talks about people <laughs> smiling with tears, you know, it has happened in like the Odyssey, you know, like they talk, you know, like there are examples of that expression that have existed throughout literature that you can quote, even though it's 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 up to your imagination to imagine like how that might might look. So like gifts feel a little bit too transient sometimes because mm -hmm. they're kind of meant to like be swapped like that. But I do think that everything, like if you, I, I remember the first emoji proposal I wrote that was uh, declined was, it was to represent existentialism. <laughs> that sounds uh, easy. <laughs> I like to go with the easy stuff first, you know? <laughs> Because uh, I look at how people are kind of force themselves to look inward. And it's okay. really, it, that it's in, throughout art history of a person looking in a mirror. You have Narcissus, okay. right? You have like old ancient um, stories about it. You have Alice in Wonderland, who are looking into a mirror. You have mm -hmm. um, just like the whole bathroom selfie thing, more in contemporary kind of a way to like, you know, and but that's more extroverted kind of um, uh, identity. Um, I didn't get past, but uh, that is the kind of reference. Like, I'm not looking to see how are people sending, pic you know, like pictures of themselves in a mirror. It's like people are deeply existential. <laughs> I know that exists. It's existed for a long time. How how has that been represented? And then kind of moved on. And then even if you end up, if if person looking in a mirror ends up succeeding and getting proposed, that doesn't necessarily mean people will use it as existentialism. Maybe they'll use it for vanity or something instead. But it, it is at least some, you know, portion of the spectrum of human emotion. That's right. When someone looks at it, even if they don't know what it is, what it is they, they understand how to use it. So like the mate emoji, I think folks from Argentina know exactly what that is. Someone from Iowa does it. And they're like, oh, it's a coconut drink. Oh, yeah, okay, and then you use it as a coconut drink, you know, and like for them, 
they've been able to derive meaning from it. And it's okay that it doesn't mean what someone else in the world thinks it means because they're not talking to that person. They're just talking to their buddy, you know, whoever, who also thinks it's a coconut drink. And so it really is just effectively like the beginning of this conversation, making sure that you're not being misunderstood and you're using it in a way that other people understand you. Jennifer, what do you have like a sense of how many proposals the committee gets and how many are approved in a, a given year, say? I don't think we share those numbers, okay. but it's, it's, it's a lot. A lot of proposals and fewer accepted, I assume? Right, so uh, the, let's see, we have reduced the number of emojis accepted to around 30 a year. Hmm. And how would you say that maybe the, well, I should mention too that we're going to head to Q&A in two or three minutes. So start thinking about your questions uh, for Gretchen and Jennifer. Um, do you have a sense of sort of like how a batch of 30 has changed over the years? I mean, particularly since you became involved? Sure, yeah. Um, so I became the subcommittee chair 2019, like late 2019. and. Um, a lot of what I was witnessing externally, like just as a person who uses emoji, then as someone who works at a company that is responsible for making the emoji, and then someone on the committee reviewing the proposals, that we were way over indexing on rhetorical possibilities and, and not enough on actually how people use emoji. And so we crafted a whole strategy last, we think we published it in 2020, um, April time, around how we were changing our process a little bit, that we, we wanna focus on things that are more useful, that have, have, have evidence of that utility. Um, to reduce the number of emoji, we actually do, I think previously it was closer to 60. Uh, and that again is because there's so many on the keyboard. As we add more, we are creating zones of exclusion without consciously trying. And so when there's less to encode, that puts more pressure on those 30 to be the best 30, not just like the first 30 that came across our desk, which could was happening previously where it was just like, oh, this one's good, this one's good, this one's good, and then it would just move forward. Um, and then we slightly modified our process in pursuit of that of those goals. And, and that process is mostly just holding ourselves accountable to the criteria for inclusion that you write in your proposal. So when you say zones of exclusion, meaning that some things are just buried too deep in the keyboard for anyone to find and then realistically use? Oh, no. I mean, how much time do we have? We I think we're trying to do Q&A soon. But I would say, like, you know, we used to just have martini glass emoji, and that was supposed to represent bar or going out for a drink. You know, you see it at international airports, right? Just a little martini glass. But now we have, like whiskey glass, a tumbler glass, and Mai Tai, and I don't know how many other alcoholic drinks we have. We have a number of other drinks too. There's like, like there's, cool. there's wine glass, but the wine glass is conventionally depicted with red wine. And so there's this question of like, well, should there also be white wine? And at a certain point, it might've been almost simpler if there was only martini glass that represented all of the alcohol, rather than sort of trying to get into the entire menu of like, you know, the rocks glass has a brown, drink in it but it, what if it had like but what are people who drink vodka or like a gin and tonic what does that look like but you don't want to reproduce the entire possible menu for a bar in emoji because then you've got like 30 50 alcohol emoji and that's <laughs> you know and you could and you could go down that rabbit hole for every single domain so it's just it's, it's menu is fallacy right and you do that with the animals as well you can do that with any category where you add chipmunk but you don't have squirrel Right, but emoji sizes, they're kind, they can be used. You can, your imagination can, in the context of the text, also will let you know what you're talking about. And maybe the drinks are a bad example because effectively all of those drinks have very distinctive containers. And so they don't need to be filled with anything. You could just put that emoji next to something else to imply what might be in it. So like, there, there, there's like lots of legacy decisions there that, that can be unwound a little bit. But what, what I'm just talking about is when you add one, like, why do we have? Mate, right? Like that's a, that's that's a very specific group of the world that understands what that is, when the rest of the world doesn't. And so, how do you and create things that feel globally relevant, but also you know that are you know 
yeah, anyway, so, and that's why that Monte is an interesting example. Someone can look at that and not know it's Monte, but have a use for it. And that's that's the important part is that that makes it globally relevant, like hand gestures. Hand gestures mean one thing on one part of the world, but that same hand gesture will mean something different. So yeah, that ambiguity is, is a key feature of emoji. So the, the zone of exclusivity is what has not been made into an emoji rather than emojis that are now being left behind? Yeah, it's more like, you know, you can do whatever you like right now. Uh -huh. But not the one. Whatever you want, anything. I mean, you pop the display. But that. not. Um... <laughs> The fun of working from home. There's an interesting proposal with the dinosaur emoji where there was a proposal for, I think, one dinosaur, and then there was a proposal for like two dinosaurs because you need a predator and a prey, and there's a proposal for three dinosaurs, and then it went all the way, way up to like, what if we imported like 32 dinosaurs to represent all of the major dinosaur, you know, species groups? And then it's like, wait a second, but do we need 32 dinosaurs? Uh, and at a certain point, the dinosaurs start really looking like each other, and, you know, it, but this is for every single category. You know, you could encode 32 dinosaurs. You could encode 32 kinds of drinks. You could encode 32, uh, like anything. <laughs> um, and like, but but at a certain point, like the usability becomes a factor and the like, maybe this pleases dinosaur fans, but people who are a fan of something else are like, why are there only like three fish? Shouldn't we be encoding like more fish? You can do it for everything. I have a thousand more questions, but I'm going to open this up to our Q&A now. Um, to start, just very quickly, somebody asked me to repeat the name of the sci-fi novel I mentioned. That was um, The Unknown World by Liz Moore. I uh, highly recommend it. The glyph thing is only a small part of it, which okay. is about AI, but it's, it's very enjoyable. Um, so Wolfgang Behrman asks, how do you determine frequency of use when speaking of adding a new emoji? We talked about this a little bit, but is there maybe a little more detail you can go into there, Jennifer? I mean, we talked actually quite a bit about frequency of use. I'm not sure if the question was asked after we talked about it or before. Um, it's again, looking at how it's currently being used, whether it be in digital spaces or not digital spaces and, and being able to kind of it grounded, uh, have a benchmark to measure it against. So, you, you know, it's not operating in some sort of vacuum. Uh, Cassidy Moody asks, what kind of self-identification emoji do you commonly see that are not people's faces? So plants, animals, sailboats, and how do you see them used? That's like, you could spend you could do PhDs on that. <laughs> I mean, there's a paper that just came out last October uh, about how studying specifically emoji and Twitter bios, which I think is probably the best way to measure mm. identity use cases versus messaging use cases. And honestly, none of the objects reached to the top 10. It was all colored hearts and soccer ball. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen people use the red rose for socialism in Twitter bios. Yeah. Uh, I think the flowers are actually a really interesting emoji use case. So Unicode released um, a bunch of sort of compiled aggregate uh, data from a combination of vendors that was all very sort of carefully anonymized um, back in, I think it was towards the end of 2019, which feels like a million years ago. Um, and I wrote a piece about that for Wired about what the, what this aggregate data can tell us um, in terms of which things are popular and sort of unsurprisingly your faces and your hands and your hearts are all very popular. Um, basically everything in that in that category, even the unpopular faces are more popular than most of the objects. Um, and one of the sort of surprising like sleeper hits in the that data set was that the flowers are really popular. Um, and it's interesting because Unicode has encoded a lot more animals lately. Um, uh, you know, in, in recent years, but the flowers have kind of remained fossilized because it's like, well, we already have like eight kinds of flowers. Do we really need more flowers? Like what are flowers for? But what's interesting about how people use flowers at a communicative level is choosing between flowers. Flowers are often used sort of almost entirely for their decorative slash semiotic function. You know, flowers are themselves a symbol in many cases. It's not just like, oh, here's a flower and they're all interchangeable, like they're in a vase on your on your table, but that this flower signifies this and this flower signifies this. And there's a lot of symbology around flowers in various different cultures for sort of how they're being used and what's going on with them. So I, I think there's potential for, there are probably some flowers that have widespread symbolic use that might not be in the, in the emoji set yet because it seemed like all flowers are being treated as a unified category, but there are actually, you know, like, 
there's the red rose for love, but there's also like, I don't know if there's a lily for, you know, peace or for, for grief or these kinds of things. Like what other, what other types of symbolic meanings do flowers have? Because yeah, in an illustrative sense, flowers are, are often really just symbols. Well, they're emblematic, right? That's right. what you're, you're actually talking about. It's like a rose means literally 15 different things. Like it, it is the, you know, at least in Western culture, but also in Eastern culture, it's like very, very emblematic of so very much, so much. I like can't even fill up. Versus other flowers, which are more decorative. Yeah. Um, I will say on the, the next emoji release, 14.0 lotus flower. Oh, nice. Is, is Great. Great. Um, um, that it also has a great deal of representation outside of literally representing lotus. I know Cassidy actually has written emoji proposals for a number of different plants. So uh, thank you, Cassidy. I'm sure uh, <laughs> I'm really expecting more proposals from you. Um, I know uh, that the there was a house plant recently added, like a plant in a pot, uh, which I thought, oh, that's very useful because this isn't just sort of an abstract plant. It's just the, like plant in the domesticated context, which is kind of neat. That's like another example of a container. You know, mm -hmm. and what I really struggled, like I, I came in much later in that process, but it's like, are we emoji, are we creating an emoji for a pot? Or are we creating mm -hmm. an emoji for a potted plant? And then why are we making a distinction between which plant it is and how do you choose? You know, do you choose the plant that isn't an emoji that has the highest frequency of, of representation in the world? You know, do mm -hmm. you pick one that's emblematic of the concept of a plant? Um, that's just a little like little seedling, you know, mm -hmm. you're forced to make these arbitrary decisions that you should not be forced to when people add these emojis. So it really needs to be able to like stand on its own. And that when you get to the design phase, go like, but what kind of Hindu temple, but <laughs> what, 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 what hemisphere will this exist on? Like you really, those, those that should be reconciled in the proposal phase. Uh, Habib El Harani asks, how different is it when Unicode asks a new emoji versus another script slash character with regards to the committee processing criteria, but also more philosophically on debates about what concepts or symbol a Unicode code point should represent? Um, and it ends with a thank you and a colon parenthesis. <laughs> <laughs> the script discussions, I only bear witness as um, an interloper uh, four times a year as part of the UTC quarterly meeting. So I'm not, I couldn't sadly give you a satisfying answer there, but a number of the folks who work on the scripting committees are on Twitter and they're very, they're, they are wonderful human beings. And if you have any questions around that, I'm, I'm sure they'd be more than open to, to discussing or chatting on Twitter about it. Um, I think one thing that's a little bit different, so as an outsider, you correct me if I'm wrong here, I think one thing that's a little bit different about the script discussions is that in many cases, uh, what symbols are in and not in a script has already been previously established in some cases by centuries of convention. So there isn't necessarily a, a, in the sort of handwritten and even you know typewritten typewriter sense or being used in a, a particular software program or something. And so there isn't necessarily as much, at least for the early stages when they were encoding very widely used scripts. And this is potentially changed when they're encoding sort of more and more newer or emerging or ancient uh, or you know sort of less standardized scripts. But at least in the early stages, like we know how many letters are in the Latin alphabet. We know how many accented characters are used in, you know, major European languages. Uh, we know, like, how many letters are in the Cyrillic alphabet. We know what, what the letters are in the Greek alphabet. You don't have to, like, go do focus groups to be like, but, like, should the letter P be in there and how should we represent it? That's not an issue that you have with scripts in the same sort of way as you have with, um, with emoji. You're like, you know, but what should the potted should like what should a potted plant look like and should it even be there is a more sort of existential question. Whereas for the scripts, there are often you can go look at newspapers that are currently being produced in this language and say what do they put in them, uh, and so there's a much bigger corpus of data to draw on. Um, and of course, that can still be a complicated question because sometimes it's like well this this symbol is used differently in this area and this area, and should we let that be dealt with at the font level where you can specify like this is the font that in displays this symbol differently. Or should we have that be encoded at the Unicode level where it's not a font and there's actually like two different symbols for how that's displayed. And that's, that's I think where the trickiness happens for the, at the script level of like, should these, should this be dealt with as a font or should this be dealt with as a, as a different script? But there are parts of it that are certainly easier than trying to figure out from the entire set of like things that could be little pictures. 
Um, we have four minutes left and several questions. So I'm going to try to get through some of these very, very quickly. Lightning round. We're going to do yes. a real quick. Um, so Karen Perello asks, do I understand that once accepted, emoji are never retired? If so, approximately 30 emoji are accepted per year. At what point does the emoji collection become unusably large? Um, and Karen notes, side note, I see there's a coronavirus emoji now. Would love to see that one retired someday. Which one? A coronavirus. Yeah, there's no coronavirus emoji, but I will say that there's already too many. There's already too many. But it isn't because there's too many of them. It's just because the experience using them hasn't adapted. It's re largely remained the same when there were 700 emoji, and now we're at over way over 3,000 emoji. And so there are ways to make that experience feel more intuitive and natural, things around proactive suggestions and prediction, things around the actual exploration of emoji themselves, the browse experience, the search experience. So, you know, like it's sort of one of those questions where one might say it's an opportunity and others might say burn it, kill it with fire. But, you know, I think the truth lies somewhere between the two. Yeah, I'll just leave it, yeah. leave it there. <laughs> We're doing lightning round. Uh, Wolfgang Behrman asks, how international is the emoji subcommittee? How much consideration does global meaning have and how does it get revised or evaluated? Which we've talked about a little bit, but I'm curious about the makeup of the committee as well. Yeah, we are surrounded by experts. I will say that it's a volunteer group that requires a great deal of work that's being done for free and asking people around the world to do work for free is very unreasonable. Like you can't ask people to do that. So what I try to do is meet up with people who maybe that time zone doesn't work and meet with them outside of the committee and consult and develop uh, strategies around whether it be um, how facial expressions are done or maybe it's about um, plants uh, or maybe it's about animals or any number of, of cultural relevancy. So um, I would say just like language is like, con you know, is for is by the people like we do the same thing and we surround ourselves by a great deal of, of individuals. Okay. Um, Gretchen Angeline Biot is asking if you could perhaps tweet the name of the study you mentioned before about emoji use. Um, I think readers were, or our audience is very interested in that. So uh, which which study was this? Uh, was um, this the with Swift Key? She says. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I did this. I can tweet that. I can tweet the paper that I mentioned about emoji as gesture as well. Um, so there's a few, uh, a few things there. I'll, I'll tweet some, some that's the relevant paper that introduced me to Gretchen. That's, that's the paper <laughs> I was like, who's that? I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think that is unfortunately just about all the time we have today, but thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I, once again, kind of want to make an emoji face to show how excited <laughs> I am about this. Um, I cannot wait to see what happens next with emoji. Um, for the audience, two upcoming events that you might be interested in on March 8th at 3 p.m. We'll be speaking for about an hour on disruptive innovation and what it looks like today and where we can find disruptive innovation where we might not expect it. And then on March 10th at noon Eastern, author Ben McIntyre will be with us to talk about his new book, Agent Sonia, which I highly recommend about um, spying and science. So Gretchen and Jennifer, thank you again for joining us and everyone, thank you for tuning in today. Thank you. Thank you.